Good morning. Am I on? Okay. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Presbyterian Church in this time of worship. Um, <clears throat> I just noticed that uh, the top of the bulletin says January 10th, 2021. Uh, fear not, this is today's uh, bulletin. Uh, I'm going to fire the secretary. Um, Uh, just uh, Jeff has been doing the bulletin lately, so I'm giving him a bad time. I can't think of anything. Uh, it, it, wouldn't, uh, it, it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Jeff right now, so I'm, uh, I'm giving him a bad time. But anyway, uh, welcome to this time of worship. I'm going to start our uh, praise of the Lord with these words from Psalm 96, verses 1 and 2. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Let's stand together to worship God. Our great God, today is the day that you have made and we intend to rejoice in it. Fill our hearts with the joy that only you can bring, the joy that transcends all of our circumstances, all of our doubts, and all of our fears. Lead us into your throne room today as we lift up the name of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Followed by a few moments for personal silent prayer. 
prayer, so I invite you to join with me. Let's pray together. Father, Father, we we confess confess our simply judgmental judgmental attitudes attitudes and absurd absurd hypocrisy. hypocrisy. We We look look on on other people people with disdain disdain and judge them obviously unable to be as smart, reasonable, pure, wise, God-fearing, or generally just as good as we are. We willfully blind ourselves to the mountain of remaining sin in our own lives, while we examine the smug satisfaction of the broken and sin-stained lives around us. Father, forgive us and wash away our hypocrisy. Give us more of the heart of Jesus, who looked on broken people with love and compassion. Amen. Hear these words from the Lord uh, from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, Dear friends, trust the good news of the gospel. Trust the promise of God and know that you are forgiven today by his grace, not by your works. And so rest in him. Amen. We are uh, going to be praying today uh, for the Living Waters Presbyterian Church in Wendell. 
and uh, their relatively new pastor, he's been there about six months now, uh, is Sean Spencer. And uh, so we'll be lifting them up in prayer. Um, and as always, I'll give you the opportunity to pray for people you're concerned about just by speaking their name and knowing that God knows the need. Let's pray together. Mighty Father, uh, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing before the foundation of the world. You chose us to be your people. You destined us in love to be your sons and daughters. And we thank you most of all that you've given us a Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord, and through him, You've forgiven our sins. You've cleansed away the stain of sin. You've set us free from bondage to sin so that we might live for you and live for the praise of your glory and so that we might have the privilege of your calling to be a part of your redeeming work in this world. And you've given us your Holy Spirit who gives us that deep assurance of of your love and gives us power to serve you. So right now in this moment of prayer, we give ourselves to you once again. We are yours, Father. We pray, use us, lead us. Uh, We pray that our church would be useful to you in this community. We pray uh, that the light of Jesus would shine brightly. And as individuals, and as we scatter in our homes, our neighborhoods, our places of work throughout the week, uh, we offer ourselves to you, we, we commit ourselves to you for your service. Father, I I lift up uh, this congregation to you and pray uh, your leading for our elders and our deacons, Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and our musicians, all those who serve uh, behind the scenes. And Father, we pray for the whole church of Jesus today your church all over the world. And uh, we pray especially for our neighboring churches right here uh, in the Treasure Valley and today especially for Living Waters Presbyterian Church over in Wendell and their pastor, Sean Spencer. We thank you, uh, Father, for uh, their faithful service to you and we pray your equipping and leading for them. And for all of us who belong to you, may we be humble before you. May we be single-minded in our devotion to you. May we seek only you, Lord. Be in awe only of you. And uh, be bold in our proclamation and our service for you. Father, we pray for those who lead our nation today and we continue to Lift up President Donald Trump as he's in the closing days of his service as president. And we pray your protection over him. And as he leaves office, we pray your protection over him and and over his family. And your leading for whatever comes next in his life. We lift up Joe Biden to you as he'll be assuming office in a few days. We pray your wisdom and leading for him. Father, we pray uh, your blessing on Governor Brad Little and uh, those who serve in his administration here in Idaho. And uh, we lift up to you the Idaho State Legislature as they're in session right now. Uh, we, We lift up 
uh, to you, all of those uh, who have gathered together uh, in the House or in the State Senate. Uh, we pray that you would give them uh, your leading and wisdom and that you would give them your protection. Uh, Lord, that they can uh, go about their work in safety. Father, we pray, lifting up to you all those who serve our community as police officers and sheriff's deputies and firefighters and EMTs. We pray your protection over them and your blessing in their lives. Father, we pray for our church family. We pray for husbands and wives that their love would grow richer and deeper. We pray for our children and young people that they would grow strong in Christ, knowing and loving and serving Him. We pray for any that are lonely, that they'd find friendship and community here. We pray for grandparents and elderly friends, that they'd find joy and usefulness in serving you. And Father, uh, we lift up to you uh, those who are in need of your healing and your restoring touch. We lift up to you Charles and Linda and Ira and Diane and Josh and Brenna and Diana and Arabelle. And if you'd like to pray uh, for someone, just go ahead and speak their name to the Lord right now. And now let's offer together the prayer that Jesus gave us to say, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. morning. I'm Peter Denniston and today's Old Testament reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 through 10. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we pray for the maturity of faith to hear your call and respond to your word. Open our ears and our hearts as we worship and give us the courage and integrity to answer your call with here I am. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hear the word of God. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to go, drink, go dim so that he could not see, but he was lying down in his own place. The lamp of, the God, lamp of God had not gone out and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called to Samuel and said, Here I am. And, ran, and, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down again. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called to Samuel again a third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, 
And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling it as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. The word of the Lord. Please stand to sing. And if you will open your Bible to John chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading with verse 43, and this is the uh, account of Jesus calling uh, his disciples, Philip and Nathaniel, and uh, just before this, in John's account, uh, Jesus called Andrew and Peter to come. He said, follow me. And uh, then immediately, he proceeds to call Philip and Nathaniel. We, ju- we just heard, <coughs> Peter just read about God speaking to the boy Samuel, uh, and with a little bit of coaching, Samuel finally figures it out. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Uh, there is a call that God puts on every one of our lives. Um, I've, I've never heard an audible voice uh, as young Samuel did, uh, but uh, I know God's call is on my life. And I also know God's call is on your life. And uh, this is uh, John's account of the way the Lord called Philip and Nathaniel. So John 1, beginning with verse 43, hear now the word of God. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip 
found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The word of the Lord. Would you bow with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> and uh, before I go any further, I want to say hello to the folks that are uh, participating at home. And I, I want you to know that you are uh, just as much a part of this gathering as uh, those that are sitting here. Well, let's, uh, let's think about uh, Philip and Nathaniel for a moment. Uh, Philip and Nathaniel were seekers. They were seeking answers to the big questions of life. Where is God? What is God doing in the world? Can I believe in God? Can I trust him? Does God care about us? Does God have a plan for Israel? Or do we just have to settle in and accept Roman occupation as our way of life. Now, uh, the reason that I know that Philip and Nathaniel were seekers is because when Jesus said to Philip, follow me, Philip didn't hesitate. He went straight to his brother Nathaniel and said, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, we found him. Now, that takes a little bit of an, of an explanation. What does he mean by, uh, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote? Uh, he means the whole Bible, or his, his whole Hebrew Bible, which was the only Bible they had. Uh, the, the Jewish people divide their scripture into two parts. There's the law and the prophets. The law is the first five books, the books of Moses, and everything else is the prophets. So when uh, Philip runs to his brother, and as I said, this is how I know that they're seekers, he immediately runs to his brother. I've found him. The one to whom all the scripture points. And, and then, of course, then he says, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, so he doesn't yet know the fullness of who Jesus is. He doesn't say, I've found Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. He's not there yet. But what he, what he says is accurate from a human perspective, even though we know that Joseph is not the biological uh, father of Jesus. He, he's, he's taken that role in Jesus' life. And... So Philip runs to his brother with all this excitement and then uh, Nathaniel reveals himself uh, to be something of an intellectual snob. Nazareth. <laughs> C 
can anything good come out of Nazareth? Um, now, that actually may have something valid in it. Um, and I'm going to talk more about it next week. Um, by the way, we're going to look at the same text next week. Uh, it'll, rest assured, it'll be a new sermon. Okay. Um, but there's just too much territory here for one Sunday. But anyway, um, there may be a, a, a little bit of validity in that when he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth is never mentioned in the Old Testament. And remember, uh, uh, Philip has just said, I've, we've found the one to whom Moses in the law and also the prophets, the one, the one that they spoke of, the Messiah. And, but Nazareth is never mentioned. Uh, and they don't know yet that Jesus is act- was actually born in Bethlehem. That, that is spoken of in the Old Testament. Um, so there may be a little bit of, uh, of, but there's also probably a little bit of intellectual snobbery here. Uh, Nazareth was in Galilee, in the northern part of the Jewish homeland. And people in the southern part, Judea, and where the capital Jerusalem was, looked down their noses at Galilee. Galileans were hicks, unsophisticated. Uh, And this is very human, isn't it? Uh, We all have a bad habit of finding other people to look down upon so that we can puff ourselves up a little bit. Um, I may have told you once or twice before that I grew up in a little town in Central California called Easton. I don't know if anybody here, has anybody heard of it? Good. Um, (coughs) uh, Easton, a little town, about a thousand people where I grew up, uh, is just south of Fresno. And so when I was a boy, going to town meant going to Fresno. And as a boy, I thought that Fresno, California was absolutely the most fabulous and impressive place on earth. Fresno had movie theaters and Sears, the most awesome place. <clears throat> McDonald's. And uh, I can remember uh, going into downtown Fresno, a little boy, going into downtown Fresno uh, at night, uh, it, driving through downtown Fresno in the car, and the incredible multicolored neon lights. Remember old downtowns with the neon lights? Um, who, in their right mind, would ever want anything other than Fresno? It was incredible. Uh, so imagine, imagine my surprise as a young man when I moved uh, to the Bay Area to go to seminary. And I discovered what people outside of Fresno thought of Fresno. <laughs> <coughs> Oh, where's your bib overalls, Moran? (laughs) Weren't you glad to get out of there? Well, I thought it was all right. (laughs) Nathaniel could not believe that somebody from a place like Nazareth could have the answers to the questions of life that he was he was seeking answers. How could somebody who came out of Nazareth have those answers? People in Nazareth were out of step, regressive, not sophisticated, not intellectual. You you can just see Nathaniel rolling his eyes. Oh, (laughs) 
Nazareth. Um, a growing number of people today view Christianity the way that Nathaniel viewed Nazareth, don't they? To many who consider themselves sophisticates, Christianity is still, still from Nazareth. They roll their eyes. Oh, Christianity, been there, done that. You know, I went, yeah, I went to Sunday school when I was a little kid, but I've outgrown that now. Christianity couldn't possibly have the answers to the, to the big questions of life, could it? So, in a, in a way, Jesus is still from Nazareth, isn't he? As far as the sophisticates are concerned. So I want to put a challenge in front of you if you are a seeker today. And if maybe there's a little bit of Nathaniel in you. Or maybe you are praying for a Nathaniel that you love. And really care about and, and want, you want that Nathaniel in your life to come and meet Jesus. I would urge the Nathaniels of the world, don't judge prematurely. Don't judge what can come out of Nazareth. Don't judge prematurely the truth of Christianity and its relevance for your life. In fact, its absolute relevance for the hope of this world. There is no other hope. There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved, as Peter says in the book of Acts. It is the only hope of broken humanity. So don't, don't judge too quickly. Don't make up your mind prematurely. Think of it this way. It's sort of like, you know, uh, when, you, when you lose your keys. And... Uh, when you lose your keys, the very first thing you do is you start looking for the keys where you know that they can be. And you're not going to waste your time looking where they can't be until you don't find them and then you humble yourself and you look where they could not have been and there they are, right? Right? There is nothing more fatal to the search for truth than intellectual snobbery. When we become intellectual snobs, <laughs> Christianity, I can't look there. I, I know I won't find the truth there. Uh, let me tell you a, a true story. Uh, the great 20th century poet, W.H. Auden. He moved to New York City in 1939. He was already uh, a famous writer. Uh, he, and he had already abandoned the Christian faith of his youth uh, because he thought he had outgrown it. Uh, he grew up in England and uh, raised in a Christian home, uh, raised in the Church of England. Uh, but uh, as a young man, and, and he, he was already a famous poet, he walked away from it. It was no longer relevant to him. But after World War II broke out, W.H. Auden shocked his friends by embracing the truth of Jesus Christ and recommitting himself to Christ and to his church. Well, what happened? Well, what happened was uh, Auden didn't stop being an observant man. Um, and he was willing to look even in Nazareth. And what happened was, uh, as the world moved deeper 
into World War II. Auden was shocked by the evil of Nazism. And he also saw that this evil of Nazism wasn't thriving in some primitive land where people were uneducated, no. It was thriving in Germany that had some of the greatest universities in the world. Uh, the leaders of the Nazi movement were all graduates of those universities. And the Nazis believed that they were superior and that there, it was just the natural order of things that the strong and, and the superior should dominate the weak. And Auden had a problem. He knew that Nazism was evil, but he also said to himself, yes, I can see that this is evil, but if there is no God, how could I ever say that the values of goodness and truth and mercy and justice are superior to their values. Unless there is a God who has revealed his will, then all that the values that we cherish, decency and fairness and protecting the weak and the vulnerable, all of those values are imaginary if there is no God. We, we just made them up. So W.H. Auden took a fresh look at Jesus and he had the same experience as Nathaniel. He believed. Jesus said two things to Nathaniel that changed his life. First, Jesus says, when, when Jesus saw him coming, he said, an is, pointed at him, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Jesus is affirming him as a transparent, straight-talking guy. Uh, honest, open, in fact, blunt. Um, I'm guessing that Nathaniel often put people off by being blunt, and he proves it. Jesus says to him, an Israelite in whom there is no guile, and what does Nathaniel say? How do you know me? <laughs> and then Jesus drops a bomb on him. And this is the second thing that changed Nathaniel's life. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Um, now, just as an aside, one of the reasons that we can trust the gospel is that this business of what was going on under the fig what was what was Nathaniel doing under the fig tree we don't know Jesus knew and Nathaniel knew now if you were making this story up if John was inventing this story you don't include strange things like this because it would just be a distraction to the reader and take you off course he's telling us this because it happened and Jesus said this. It's not fiction. Jesus knew and Nathaniel knew and that's what matters. It was, but it was so private and so significant, so significant to Nathaniel that he blurted out, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So Jesus has just gone from being Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, to you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Now my guess is, I'm just guessing, my guess is that Nathaniel was praying under the fig tree. Uh, crying out to God. And Jesus says, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, 
Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, uh, Jesus is making a reference that any devout Jew that knew his Bible would recognize. And I think Nathaniel knew his Bible. More about that next week. But that's why Philip ran to him. I found the one to whom the law and the prophets point. Nathaniel knows his Bible. He's referring to the book of Genesis. Remember Jacob. And Jacob is the first Israelite. Now, Jesus sees Nathanael, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Jacob, whose name became Israel, was full of deceit, right? He, he, was, a, he, he, was, a, he was a deceitful man, tricked his brother out of the birthright. Well, remember in the book of Genesis, Jacob is on the run. He thinks he's on the run from his brother, but he's really on the run from God, uh, which, which is a vain effort, by the way. It never works. And one night he was exhausted, and he laid down to sleep. He's out in the boonies, and he laid down to sleep, Jacob did. And he put his head on a rock for a pillow. And as, as he slept, he dreamed. And he dreamed that he saw a ladder or a stairway from heaven to earth and angels going up and down the ladder. Now, that's, uh, Jacob's ladder is often misunderstood, and particularly because there's that song that we learned as kids. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Remember? We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Uh, no. The dream was not we have to climb this ladder to, to heaven. The dream that Jacob had was that heaven was not, a far, not as far away as he thought. But God was going to make a link between heaven and earth. The angels, the messengers of God, not us, the, the, the angels are going up and down the ladder. In other words, Jacob was given a dream that heaven and earth, which have been separated by our sin, heaven and earth are going to be reconnected. There's going to be a bridge that God will make between heaven and earth. And Jesus told him, you're going to see the angels ascending and descending on the, on the Son of Man. Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is the fulfillment of Jacob's dream. He's the bond, the link, the bridge between heaven and earth. What an incredible claim Jesus is making. And the only thing that he asks of Nathaniel and Philip, well, <laughs> he asks everything, doesn't he? Follow me. Leave your previous life behind. Trust in me and follow me. And Jesus makes the very same call and the very same invitation to you and me. There's only one who has bridged the gap by his cross, bridged the gap between heaven and earth. And that's Jesus Christ. He's made a way for broken and sinful people like you and me to come once again into the presence of God and to know God and to experience his forgiveness and be made new and whole. So trust him today. If you're, a, if you're a Nathaniel, what good can come out of Nazareth? Remember what his brother said. 
Do you remember what Philip said? Come and see. Come and see. See for yourself. Step out. Take the risk. Trust him. Let's pray. Mighty Father, uh, we thank you for our Savior Jesus who came to call us back to you. Uh, Thank you for this uh, wonderful account of the way that he called Philip and Nathaniel. They came with some skepticism, or at least Nathaniel did. Uh, But Lord, you revealed yourself to him. And in your faithfulness, you do the same with us if we'll only come and see. Uh, So, Lord, uh, I pray for each one here to take a step closer to you today. And if there are any Nathaniels in our lives, people that that we care about that may be carrying some skepticism right now, uh, give us grace and boldness to invite Come and see. And we pray it in the strong name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Please uh, join me in the affirmation of faith, the, the, the Apostles' Creed. It's printed in your bulletin on the back page. If you'll stand as you are able. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand. brought an offering today, there's a
handy little basket right up here on the table. Uh, you can just bring it up and put it in the basket. And uh, we are continuing our Wednesday night Zoom Bible study. And uh, I'm, I'm, as I've told you before, I'm counting the days until Zoom is an unpleasant memory. Uh, but you know what? It, it's, not, it's not bad. It, it's actually kind of fun. And uh, try to keep it to half an hour. Uh, but you know how successful I am at that. So, you know, we go over a little bit. But uh, you're invited to participate. If you're, if you're not already on the email distribution for that, uh, just uh, send me an email or talk to me after worship, and I'll uh, get you on that list. Go now in peace, love, and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, and may the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you now and abide with you evermore. Amen.